and uh, and I checked into a, a, a I took a team from here to Texas. You're all right with just rambling, right? Yeah. All right, because because this is weird. So I, I check into a hotel room in Texas. I've got maybe 15, 20 students with me, and I check into the hotel room, and the gal behind the counter says, "Oh, you've got a room. Your room is 308." And I thought, that's a good caliber of a rifle. Uh, you're all right with just rambling, right? Hello, Bethel T3. That was Bill Johnson of Revival Focus, Signs and Wonders Obsessed, Bethel Church in Redding, California, during his ramble, I mean sermon, on March 10th, 2021, entitled Drawing Near to God. Now, not to leave you hanging with the 308 rifle reference, let's allow Bill to take the safety off his somewhat spurious sounding spiel. But first, here's a little backstory for context. And I remember praying for an extended period of time. I uh, just, if it, God, it, do you want me to write? It's in my heart to write. And one night, middle of the night, he spoke and he woke me up with his voice. Hmm. With his voice. And I'll tell you exactly what he said. He said, Isaiah 30, verse 8. Wow. That was it. I woke up and I thought, that was clear. <laughs> and I waited and nothing else came. So when I opened my Bible to Isaiah 30, right. verse 8, it right. says, Now, go and write. Well, of course. <laughs> All right. No more excuses. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, <clears throat> on the info section for this video are listed four scripture references Bill supposedly uses in this sermon. Isaiah chapter 30, verse 8 is one of them. He will reference Isaiah 30, verse 8, but that's about all Bill is willing to squeeze out of it because Bill will not be preaching today, but rather telling of his own personal journey and how he draws near to God. Okay, back to Bill's fantastic firearm focus fractured fairy tale. Okay, he's checking into a hotel room in Texas and he is given room number 308. So let's, uh, let's continue. When, uh, when she gave me room 308, I thought, yep, it's a good caliber of a rifle. And I, I just laughed it off, went to my room, went to the next city, 308. I went, this is confirmation. I need to go hunting, uh, you know? Uh, of <laughs> and then uh, that morning I woke up at 308 mm. and I went, all right, all right, what's, what's up? What's the deal? I've had these things happen before. I just simply ask him a question and he speaks. Uh -huh. But this time he was silent. No. He was silent. Several days later, I'm home. I'm in my office. And I remember, I asked him if I should write. And he said, Isaiah 30, verse 8. And I have just filled my calendar and there is no time to write. Why does he speak in mystery? Mm, I don't know. Because then you'll linger longer in his presence. Oh, wow, sighs the crowd. Um, is it lingering longer or beguiling the gullible? Now, what's fascinating is that Isaiah 30 is all about Israel's refusal to listen to God and instead seeking to take refuge under the protection of Pharaoh and shelter in the shadow of Egypt. After verse 8, we read that God's rebellious people say to the seers, of which Bill would consider himself one, do not see and to the prophets, they say, do not prophesy to us what is right. Speak to us smooth things. Prophesy illusions. And that is exactly what the people at Bethel Church crave from apostle, that's what they call him, Bill. This message from Bill begins with a special emphasis on Lyme disease, which, by the way, with a couple weeks course of antibiotics can be taken care of in most and cases. And a friend of mine from Nashville was here. Uh, Rebecca Williams, and she um, sent me this text okay. after she got home. She writes me, she says, my friend just texted me this morning. Mm -hmm. She was watching Bethel TV last Sunday night All right. when you got the word about God healing Lyme disease. That's what it was. I gave the testimony, and the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. Now, let's stop right there. It's the second scripture reference listed. It's Revelation 19, verse 10. 
And since Bill won't bother to look at it in context, let's take a crack at it. We'll pick it up at verse 9. And the angel said to me, that's John, seeing the vision and then writing it down. Uh, he's, the, the angel says, blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he said to me, these are the true words of God. Then I fell down at his feet to worship him. But he said, you must not do that. I am a fellow servant with you and your brothers who hold to the testimony of Jesus. Worship God. For the testimony of Jesus is the spirit, or you could say the essence of prophecy. See, we are to rely solely on the truth of God's revealed word. It's where we find Jesus and his gospel, both in the Old and New Testaments. We are never to focus on the messenger bringing the word as anything more than, well, an errand boy delivering the newspaper, as it were. Even if that messenger considers himself a modern-day seer and an apostle with a capital A. Anytime you hear a testimony, there is a covenant from God to duplicate the miracle. All right. Please point us to a place in God's word that substantiates that claim. This, this is what Bill says next. And it's important for us to adjust our thinking to step in line with what God is doing. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I, I didn't think he'd come up with one. So Lyme disease is the dysfunctional flavor of the day that Bill and Bethel Church will engage with in spiritual warfare. We're just going to open up the floodgates right now. If you have Lyme's disease or you have a yeah, relative Lyme or disease. close friend with that disease, stand right now because we're going to pray over it. We have seen now just people standing in proxy. This is a new th on a new level for us in the last, I would say, year uh, of God releasing that miracle anointing through somebody standing in proxy. We're going to do that right now. Okay. The remote healing of Lyme disease by proxy. You know, the symptoms of Lyme disease are very similar to those of COVID-19 or the seasonal flu. So if God is able to heal Lyme disease by proxy, then the flu or COVID-19 should be a no-brainer. So why has Bethel Church not been remote healing thousands and thousands of people this whole last year who had these very similar symptoms with these viruses that have been floating around? Psalms 107 verse 20 says, He sent His Word and healed them. Those of you that are standing in proxy, I want you right now, declare the Word of the Lord that heals that person you're standing in for. Just declare their name. Gracie is delivered and released from Lyme's disease in the name of Jesus. Make that decree. Okay, that's number three on the hit parade of scripture references that shoot by faster than a bullet out of a 308 rifle. Psalm 107 verse 20 is much like Psalm 103. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits, who forgives all your iniquity, who heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from the pit, who crowns you with steadfast love and mercy, who satisfies with good so that your youth is renewed like the eagle. Now, even though it says, who heals all your diseases, we know Christians who, by God's seemingly harsh providence at the time, are not healed in this life, but will be in the life to come. But that's something you won't hear from Bill Johnson. So once this medicinal mumbo jumbo and pathological proxy dog and pony show is over, Bill finally gets to the meat of his message. The key for Everything that Jesus did was that he, he did what he saw his father do. Okay, now you got to get this. Bill is under the mistaken notion that everything that Jesus did, um, specifically in the way of miracles, we as Christians can do as well. Jesus says in John chapter 8, the son can do nothing of his own accord, but only what he sees his father doing. For whatever the father does, that the Son does likewise. Now, in that passage, we, we see the glorious eternal harmony of the Father and the Son. But Bill insists on grabbing some of that glory for himself, and that is a very dicey proposition. For a number of years, I would have, um, I would have this, this, like a fire. I, this is feeling strange now. I'm starting to feel a little self-conscious. Oh, that's not good. So I, I have something else I'm gonna, I was going to teach. Right now, I don't know what I'm going to do. 
except just feel self-conscious and just tell you some of my personal journey. So I think that'll have to be good enough for tonight. That'll have to be good enough for tonight, huh? Apparently, Bill prepared a sermon, but midstream decides that sharing his personal journey would be much more edifying. And all I can say is, holy smokes, you know, that takes a whole lot of chutzpah. I would have this thing happen where I would feel this fire, it's like a fire, rest on my right shoulder. Sunshine on my shoulder. Boy, talk about sunshine on my shoulder. <laughs> it's also more than coincidental that William Branham, uh, the Signs and Wonders evangelist of the 1940s and 50s, was said to be displaying a pillar of fire on his right shoulder in this picture right here. Bill is now going to talk about how we can draw near to God by being quiet and listening for his audible voice and also by getting certain feelings like fire on your shoulder and by observing the things that happen all around us. Here Bill is using Jesus as an example of when to speak and when not to. He knew how much to say to one person. For example, somebody would come and say, what is truth? Now, Bill has this habit of freestyling a passage of scripture. What he just quoted, what is truth, immediately made me think of Pilate's words to Jesus in John 18, verse 38. But no, that's not even close. He's actually referring to the man uh, recorded in all three synoptic gospels who comes up to Jesus and asks, what must I do to inherit eternal life? It was a great time to preach his great sermon, but he chose not to because he knew when to speak and when not to. Mm. Person says, what is truth? Jesus says, what is it to you? He quotes a few commands. Jesus says, do that and you'll be fine. What was he doing? Turning his attention back to what he already knew but wasn't living. See, what is truth? That's not even in that passage. What's actually happening in this account, as I see it, is Jesus showing the man that although he thought he was keeping the commandments, he wasn't even keeping the first one. You know, have no other gods before me, let alone the other nine. And that's why he and me and you need someone who not only kept all of God's laws all the time without break, because moral perfection is what God will require of each one of us, but also someone to stand in our place and take on God's infinite justice and wrath towards those who have broken his moral laws. Jesus is the only one that fits that bill. There are times where the Lord just puts something in front of me over and over and over again, and I tend to be a little bit on the slow side. And I just had one of those situations in October of 2003. I have it written in one you of my journals. You just had it in 2003? This will sound rather simple to you, but I, for an extended period of time, had constantly run into the number 555. It'd be an address, it'd be a license plate, it would be... Huh, 555. I never thought of that. Now, does that mean that God is trying to reveal some deep mystery if you happen to see some object or number reoccurring time after time? Oh yeah, this is very interesting. Now that my mother is advanced in years, I do her taxes. And the day after I watched this sermon, uh, you know, a few days back, she received her federal tax refund check. And guess what the amount was? Yep. $333. Now, truth be told, since I started my channel, I have seen the number 333 all over the place. I chalk it up to the tendency to be more kind of aware of something that you become interested in. It's like you notice a new car that you happen to like. And what happens next? You start to see that car all over the place. There's another example. All right. I woke up the other night as I was doing the preparation for this video, and this is no joke, I'm not making this up. I looked at my phone, which was on my nightstand, and lo and behold, what do you think I saw? Three, three, three. Now, what do you think God was trying to tell me? Well, most likely nothing more than, hey, it's still early, go back to sleep. But what deep thing was God trying to tell Bill Johnson? Let's, uh, Take a look and see. 
I hopefully get a chance to sleep a little longer in the morning, and I wake up, and I look at the clock, and it's 555. Thankfully, Benny stayed home on that trip so I could be out loud uh-huh. and, uh, and not wake her. So right. I woke up, I looked at the clock, it's 555, right. and I said out loud, what, what are you trying to tell me? <laughs> what was God trying to tell Bill uh, concerning the number 555? It's a hard experience to explain, but it was though I was instantly asleep and he spoke audible. Audible? I don't know how that works. I just know what happened. He said, the anointing for the day of the cancellation of debt is upon you. (laughs) Debt cancellation? What debt? Personal debt? Uh, Church debt? You would think that's a big deal. But here is what Bill says next. And then I woke up. The anointing for the day, it was was as clear as my voice. The anointing for the day of the cancellation of debt is upon you. I know that whenever anyone talks about strange things like this, different ways of hearing from God, it gives the weirdest people among us permission to get weirder. See, he never explains what the very words of God given directly to him were about. He simply continues as if he never told the story about 555, but saunters off into some other form of mystical madness. And a roadrunner came up to the window with a big old lizard in its mouth and would just dance up against the glass. (laughs) Next prayer meeting, same thing. He showed up again. He didn't come to any of my sermons, but he came to (laughs) prayer meetings. Okay, uh, Bill then tells a long, drawn-out story of this roadrunner who kept showing up at their prayer meetings with a lizard in his mouth. I know what anointing and presence is. And I would have all this confidence as we'd walk towards, and I actually experimented. I would get about eight feet away, and it would lift. The anointing. It was on me. Oh, it's back. That would lift. That's gone. All right. um, So long story short, the roadrunner finally dies in the church building by flying into a plate glass window. And Bill is talking there about trying to raise him from the dead. But something strange happens to Bill's anointing as he approaches the dead bird. All right, let's continue. I prayed anyway. I don't, I don't want to just reduce things to what I discern because I know that I see in part. Mm. I put my two fingers on his head. <laughs> <laughs> Spoke life the best I knew how and nothing happened. Okay, w- let me stop it right there. So the bird had the same effect on Bill's anointing as kryptonite did uh, to Superman's super strength. My office. I went, You've been trying to talk to us for months and I still don't get it. What's, what's up with this? And he spoke to me. What did he say? He said, what I am bringing into the house mm-hmm. has to have a way of being released from the house okay. or it will die in the house. Uh-huh. Okay. So, you know, the roadrunner had to get into the house, but it needed to get out of the house or it would die in the house, which is exactly what happened to the roadrunner. You know, wouldn't it be great if uh, the God of the universe would speak sweet mysteries into your ears? But alas, that privilege is reserved only for the modern day super apostles. But that's the journey we're on. And I want to invite you into another level of hearing and seeing because he's invited us to do what the Father's doing and to say what the Father's saying. That's so wrong. So wrong. (laughs) That was weird, but it it was good. (laughs) <laughs> well, it was weird, all right, but good? Well, that remains debatable. Bill likes to use Bible verses and tell Bible stories about Jesus, but the Jesus he proclaims is another Jesus that the, Bible's, the Bible knows not of. This is a quote from Bill in um, Charisma magazine. He says, while Jesus was eternally God, he emptied himself of his divine powers and became a man. See Philippians chapter 2, verse 7. It's vital to note that he did all his miracles as a man, not as God. If he did them as God, I would still be impressed. But because he did them as a man, yielded to God, I am now, 
unsatisfied with my life, being compelled to follow the example he has given us. Jesus is the only model for us to follow. You see, that's how Bill can say at the beginning and the end of this. The key for everything that Jesus did was that he, he did what he saw his father do. And I want to invite you into another level of hearing and seeing because he's invited us to do what the Father's doing, and to say what the Father's saying. Oh. Why don't you stand? No. That's another Jesus and another gospel. At no time did Jesus do his miracles as only a man, not as God. That is sloppy theology, to say the least. The eternal Son, in the fullness of time, took upon himself an additional nature, a human nature. And Philippians 2, verse 7, well, it tells us that he emptied himself of his divine prerogatives and instead relied on the power of the Holy Spirit that was indwelling him without measure. I refer you to John chapter 3, verse 34. But at no time since his conception in the womb of the Virgin Mary was Jesus not truly God and truly man. One divine person with two distinct yet united natures. Put your hand, hand on your head again. I know we already did it yeah, once. To God, release the dreams. Oh, sorry. Teach us with the dreams. You know why he gives us strange dreams? And so we'll stop and have dialogue. Strange dreams? <laughs> you know, he never really talked about how Christians are to draw near to God. And, you know, I think there are two passages that uh, are really important when talking about drawing near to God. The first one is James chapter 4, verse 8. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Now, contrary to popular belief, this verse is not directed to unbelievers, but rather believers. To draw near to God is to forsake worldliness with all its fleshly allure. Christians are to fight against the sin that remains, quickly repent when we fall into it, and put all our blue chips on the promise of God's grace in Jesus Christ. James tells us as much in the preceding verses. He says, but he gives more grace. Therefore, it says, God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. See, only the humble who know the depth of their sin, even as Christians, and fight against it, will bend the knee to the Savior in true worship. And it is only by God's grace that Christians can do so. Now, the other passage I find very profound in this, uh, in, in this line of thinking about drawing near to God is found in Hebrews chapter 10, verses 19 through 21. Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the holy place by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that he opened for us through the curtain, that is, through his flesh, and since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. You know, unlike the old covenant people who could never enter, in, enter into the most holy place themselves, new covenant Christians are, well, the, the ones that are in Christ can with confidence and boldness enter into the very dwelling place, the throne room, where we find God's grace. Believers can draw near to God through the one-time sacrifice of the great high priest who himself was the true and final sacrifice, a pure and spotless sacrifice that was of infinite value and alone able to take away God's just wrath towards sinners. We draw near to God with a true heart and a true faith that trusts in Christ alone. The presence of God is not some individual anointing that gets weaker as we approach a roadrunner, but is found where God's people, who are his temple on earth, gather together, having been baptized with water as a sign of the cleansing of our sins and a newness of heart. This spiritual temple of God's people pray prayers of thanksgiving and of confession, of supplication, they sing praises to God, hear God's word preached, and receive the visible signs of Christ's body and blood shed for us once for all in the most intimate meal we can partake 
of, with God and each other, this side of glory. Now, one more passage that Bill could have proclaimed is from Hebrews, again, chapter 7, 23 through 25. We read there, The former priests were many in number because they were prevented by death from continuing in office, but he holds his priesthood permanently because he continues forever. Consequently, he is able to save to the uttermost those who draw near to God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them. Friends, if you haven't yet, find a church where Jesus and his journey to the cross for sinners like us is the main thing the church is all about. It is that that will draw us nearer to God and nothing else. To do to help me to see, but that's the journey we're on. And I want to invite you into another level of hearing and seeing because he's invited us to do what the Father's doing and to say what the Father's saying. Why don't you stand?